All right, good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. Um, welcome to the uh, 30th Annual uh, School of Natural Sciences Senior Symposium Day. Uh, my name is Bilal Shibaro, and I'm a faculty member in the Computer Science Department and the uh, director of the Institute for Interdisciplinary Science, also known as I4. Uh, on the behalf of our wonderful I4 team, Dr. Rebecca Thompson, Dr. Uh, Andrea Algado, Dr. Paul Walter, and Dr. Chuck Hauser, we'd like to welcome you in celebrating uh, this kickoff event of our Senior Symposium Day. Um, to start off, I really want to ask you kindly to uh, give a round of applause for our senior students who we are celebrating their uh, senior projects and, and research work today. So please. <laughs> sound is so cool. <laughs> you know, I imagine I'm going to see virtual claps. Uh, it's so good really to see you in the same room and not on Zoom. Um, we're all tired from the words of your mic is muted, I can't see your screen, or, you know, can everybody please have your cameras on? Everybody's cameras on today. Wonderful. <laughs> Speaking of cameras, uh, we are recording this event. And we're also recording it on a 360 camera. So uh, this is recording you all in 360 views. So my best advice for you is to always keep smiling the entire time. <laughs> um, I hope you had the opportunity to uh, scan and go uh, the QR code uh, for attendance purposes. And please expect a survey uh, early next week uh, about this event. Uh, I uh, want to really. Uh, say thank you to all of you for being here. I want to thank our NSI staff, especially Lindsay Young, for helping us organize this event. Uh, a special thank you for Dr. Santiago Toledo for also organizing and helping us with this event and inviting our keynote speaker. And with this, I want to invite Dr. Toledo to introduce our keynote speaker. Hey everybody, good afternoon, and welcome to the 30th Annual Senior Symposium. This is awesome. This is a true celebration of the accomplishments and academic accomplishments of all of the students here in the natural sciences. We're ex extremely excited about it. Today I have the honor of introducing our speaker, Dr. Ilya Finkelstein. So um, I'll tell you a little bit of stories. I kind of have a chance and the pleasure to have known him personally. But uh, I don't want to screw up his trajectory, so I'm going to start reading about some of his accomplishments. Um, uh, he earned his BS degree from the University of California, Berkeley, in 2001. He got his PhD in chemistry from the University of, from Stanford University in 2007, and did his postdoctoral training in molecular biophysics from Columbia University Medical Center in 2012. That same year, he joined the faculty at the University of Texas, where he's currently holding a position as an associate professor in the Department of Molecular Biosciences. Uh, he is the Lorraine Morrow Kelly Faculty Fellow. His team, his team work is beautifully interdisciplinary in nature which is actually well aligned with the spirit of the i Institute, and we're very excited to have him here today. His work focuses on bioinformatics, molecular biophysics, biomedical engineering, and computer science. Some of the specifics of his work are focused on the development of biophysical tools to understand how molecular machines edit and repair our genomes, including single molecule biophysical studies. Also, applications of CRISPR, adaptive immunity, mammalian gene editing, and the mechanism of genome maintenance. Chemist, some of these things actually a little bit obscure to me. He's been the recipient of numerous awards. Uh, to mention just a few, in 2013, he was named a prodigy by the Academy of Medicine, Engineering, and Science here in Texas. In 2015, he received the prestigious National Science Foundation Career Award. And in 2021, very recently, the Wells Foundation named him the Norman Hackerman Award in Chemical Sciences. This award recognizes the accomplishments of chemical sciences in Texas and is designed to encourage scientists who are embarking in careers dedicated to increasing our fundamental understanding of chemistry. For this award, Dr. Finkelstein was recognized for his innovative methods to understand how cells repair DNA and maintain integrity on their genetic information, with the ultimate goal of improving the efficacy and safety of gene editing. Additionally, and it's the work that he's going to tell us about today, the Wells Foundation acknowledged and highlighted Dr. Finkelstein's lab work on the development of critical reagents for the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. In collaboration with colleagues, with colleagues at UT, Dr. Finkelstein and his lab worked on the optimization for the production of the viral spike protein, 
which is a critical component for the COVID-19 vaccine. On a personal note, I actually had the chance of knowing Dr. Finkelstein. Uh, he's an avid runner, and I attempted to be an avid runner myself. He's a self-declared weekend warrior. He goes around and runs around like crazy, and he can boast a current marathon record time of 3 hours and 11 seconds. I will always hold those 11 seconds again. <laughs> he's, always, he's very upset about that, so I like to do that. That's an amazing time. To give you some perspective, that's a mile running at a pace of 6 minutes and 53 seconds for a total of 26.2 miles. So just think about that. That's pretty insane. So it's really cool because in the mornings, we get out there in the morning, run at 5.30, and it's often very common to hear uh, Ilya talking about the biochemical processes of running. So he's always talking about this, and like, why it matters, and I'm always listening behind. And then I think he also likes to talk about this debate that is ongoing about the power of the mind and the body. So that's really interesting. However, I never get to tell the whole story because he's faster than me. So I like hear half of the story and he just runs away and I'm chasing behind him. So just impressive. Um, I and others really appreciate his supportive attitude and his great sense of humor, and especially in those early morning runs when we kind of need that extra push. He's always there with his healthy competitiveness, competitiveness to push us all to do better. I can't wait to hear your signs, and without further ado, I want to give him a round of applause for Dr. Kilia from this. Thank you, Santiago. That introduction was too kind. You should know a gentleman never shares their marathon time. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thank you all for coming out here. I really appreciate you being in person. I, too, am excited about standing in front of you instead of being in front of a Zoom window. I think this is my first seminar back in person. We did a lot of Zoom seminars, so I'm excited, too. And today I'm going to tell you about our work on SARS-CoV-2, which is, as you heard, really not my forte. This is something I got into out of necessity, like many of us who had to switch gears when the pandemic hit. So I thought I'd start by giving you a little picture of what um, the infectious moment of SARS-CoV-2 infection is that looks like. Here is the viral membrane on your left. On your right is the cell. Now this protein is the spike protein that decorates the virus. And this is the point, this is an artistic rendering, based on structure saw at UT Austin, uh, of the, the point where the spike protein makes first contact with the cell surface receptor called ACE2. Important note, not all of you are biologists. If I slip into jargon, please stop me. I would really appreciate that. So, all of these words were foreign to me as well, because I'm not a virologist or a vaccinologist. Uh, we got into this um, during the pandemic. And I just wanted to give you a little timeline of how this happened. Okay. So, in December 21st, 2019, there's a cluster of pneumonia patients identified by the Chinese CDC. That's for disease control in China. Very quickly thereafter, the genomes were sequenced, and the causative agents of this unusual pneumonia turned out to be a beta coronavirus family uh, particle. The first genome was released by actually, oh, this pointer's done. Chance to do the, uh, the first genome was released, again, by a courageous Chinese scientist on January 10th. And um, UT Austin has played a very important part in the global response to the pandemic because uh, we have an actual vaccinologist on campus, Jason McClellan, who on January 20th of 2020 uh, purified and cloned the spike gene, or the S protein, this S gene, from the virus. And this is a critical protein that we'll spend the rest of the hour talking about. Okay, very shortly thereafter, one month later, the structure was made available for the global community of this important protein uh, with specific modification, this 2P or double proline modification. And that modification is going to become important later. Um, two months after all of this started happening, UT Austin shut down, and most of the Austin and most of the US shut down as the pandemic was raging. Early in January, I had already understood that this was going to be a big deal, and we were heading towards potentially a global cataclysmic event. So we very quickly started working with the labs of uh, Jason uh, McClellan and Jennifer Maynard in chemical engineering, who's an antibody engineer, um, to start building out what we knew would be an important aspect of any kind of vaccine for this uh, viral agent. So as the university was shutting down, we were ramping up. So I mean, February, and uh, we already had our kickoff meetings, and by March, we were already working on vaccine antigens to try to get into people and actually into the hands of Moderna and Pfizer. Um, as quickly as possible. But let me take a step back. Um, 
Let me tell you a little bit about the virus so you understand why the spike protein is going to play such a central role in our discussion today. All right. So uh, why is this thing called coronavirus after all? Um, on the top left, you see a picture of uh, a historical picture of a coronavirus um, taken using electron microscopy, a very high resolution microscope. And on the right is a description that the authors gave to that uh, image. This was, I think, 1960s. Yes, 1968. There are, these particles are more or less rounded in profile, although there's a certain amount of polymorphism. They also have a characteristic fringe of projections, 200 angstroms long, which are rounded or petal shaped, okay? uh, rather than the sharper pointed than the mixing my my myoxiviruses. This, appears, this appearance recalls a solar corona. So there's the solar corona, and that's why they're called coronaviruses. Because when you look at them on the microscope, they have this spiky projection. This spiky projection is precisely that spike protein that we're talking about, shown here in the middle in an artistic illustration in green. And I'm going to show you a little worm disease. Why do we care about the spike protein? Again, this is a simulation based on real structures. But this is how the spike protein acts like a molecular harpoon to get into the cell to inject the viral genome into, our, into the host. So here's how it starts. All right. This is the viral spike protein. It's got two major subunits, S1 and S2. And the little white beans over here are glycans. They're a sugar coat that tries to protect the virus from our antibodies. Um, the receptor binding domain of the spike protein contacts the cell surface receptor. And then check this out. The virus literally harpoons into the cell via the spike protein. We are a very large conformational change in structure of the protein. So this happens in a few places. Then there's a zipping up of this alpha helical domain, these little ribbons, and the virus literally pulls together the membranes of the virus and the cell to inject the material. Right, so this is what's happening. And you saw these massive conformational changes that accompany uh, these transitions from what looks like a petal or, or maybe a mushroom shape uh, form of the spike protein into what is called the post fusion state where it, it is now able to capture the membrane of the, cell, uh, of the cell. All right, so how can we know so much about this? And why, did we, why were we able to make these vaccines in a year, we meaning the broader scientific community? The reason for that is because SARS-CoV-2 is not the first uh, uh, type of coronavirus that's circulating in humans. Yeah. Here we go. Now this is uh, a family tree, if you will, a molecular family tree of related uh, enveloped RNA viruses, specifically focusing on coronaviruses, or COVIDs, okay? And they break up into different families, different clades, is the technical term, okay? So SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 are in the green petal over there. But other members of this larger family tree are endemic in humans. There's about half a dozen endemic uh, coronaviruses in humans. Why do they not cause pandemics? Well, uh, many of them uh, cause common cold-like symptoms. We've had them. We know about them. They're not very severe. Uh, MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, is rare and is quite lethal. Right? It never broke out as a pandemic. It was a localized epidemic in the Middle East. Uh, it's frequently fatal. I think the case fatality rate is something like 30 to 40 percent. And there was some work done on MERS, um, actually by my colleague Jason, uh, that allowed us together as a team to very quickly jump ahead and understand something about SARS-CoV-2. And I also want to remind you, SARS-CoV-1, at the time called SARS-CoV, was a localized epidemic in the early 2000s in Asia. Uh, never crossed the uh, border. It wasn't as transmissive as SARS-CoV-2, but SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 were related viruses. And even around the early 2000s, people were working on SARS-CoV-1 uh, countermeasures already. So it was this wealth of fundamental information and work on these facts, uh, other viruses that allow us to leap forward and try to understand something about how to make an antigen that could go into vaccines quickly. Right. And here's the key point. Okay. Uh, again, here's a picture of that uh, virus before it contacts and captures the cell, and here's a picture of it after it contacts the cell. A massive conformational change. The virus changes shape, right? Uh, these little ribbon diagrams, if you're not used to them, these are alpha helices. And in the pre-fusion state, before cell entry, um, these alpha helices are bent via flexible loops shown in the schematic over here. So the green and the blue 
are two separate helices, shown here as uh, a cylinder, but here as loops. And then note that when uh, triggering occurs and this thing goes into a post fusion state, when it's in that harpoon state, the green and blue helices organize into one very, very long alpha helix. So here's the name of the game in vaccine design. You want to get uh, an immune response, you want to stimulate your own body to make an immune response against the form of the virus that hasn't yet gained entry into your cells. If the virus is already in this shape, if your immune system is recognizing this molecule, it's too late. The virus has already infected you, so there's no point in, it is impossible to neutralize it at that point. You want to prevent the virus from going into the state, i.e. you want to have your antibody response, your adaptive immune response, trained against this entry form of the virus, the pre-fusion state. This molecule, however, is metastable. It exists in both states, and it's it's, on a, it's like on a trigger. It's really, really ready to pop and go into this state because that's its point. It's trying to get into your body. Well, um, the name of the game in vaccine design in making antigens is to stabilize this form by engineering the protein so that when you present this stabilized form to your body, you can your body can uh, train a strong immune response and capture the majority of the viral particles in this state before they can trigger. All right. So, a lot of words. Name of the game, stabilize this thing. How do you stabilize it? Well, you prevent it from undergoing this very large conformational change. And so, what we and others have done in the past is look at how to make this thing not change, based on really important work from SARS-CoV-1 and MERS and HK1, which causes the common cold. Uh, uh, folks recognize that uh, breaking this transition of this disordered loop into this very ordered alpha helix could be the way to go to prevent this triggering event. So installing specifically purlins at those red positions there allows us to stabilize it. And so there's purlins that can be installed in those red positions. They're quite conserved between Mars, uh, MERS and SARS and HP1. Uh, stabilizes the virus in the prefusion uh, stabilized state. All right, so this is the structure that of UT Austin, which is called HHSL, and UT Austin in his lab put out. And here's a picture of that structure. The virus actually exists as a homotrimer. Um, one of the three subunits is shown in the Griffin diagram. On top is the structure of that domain, key domains in there. I'm just going to highlight a few important domains for the discussion here. Um, the RBD stands for the receptor binding domain, it's shown in green. Uh, and you can see it's kind of flipped up. As the name implies, the receptor binding domain is the thing that makes contact with the cell the ACE2 surface receptor on the cell, and begins this triggering process. And also the N-terminal domain, shown on the left in blue, and also colored in blue over here, uh, is very important for training our immune response. And we'll talk about N-terminal domain later. So um, by installing two specific proline at a particular position, somewhere it's actually buried in the S2 core, uh, they were able to trap the virus in this, in this pre-fusion stabilized form. Okay. And it, it was a pretty good first generation design. Um, so this specific design is part of sort of SARS-CoV-2 spike um, stabilizing the pre-fusion form. Just two prolines were added in a key position. Okay. This is the virus, uh, the antigen design that's currently used in Moderna, Pfizer, Novavax, and pretty much most, except for AstraZeneca, most of the vaccines out there. So this really, really was important. And this is work that was done in Austin at UT. Uh, but unfortunately, we knew by February of the beginning of the pandemic that although this was an important and good design, it was a, not the best design we could do. It was what we could do in a month or two months. It had low limit, a low yield, it denatured very easily, which if you think about a human therapeutic, is a big problem, right? We, I don't know if you recall hearing about the cold chain problem. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? How do you supply something that needs to be a minus 80 degrees to a rural village, maybe in Africa or even in the US? There was a lot of challenges with cold chain delivery. And this was partially due to the instability of this antigen. Uh, and unfortunately, it didn't produce a focused immune response. So just because you can get antibodies against an antigen doesn't mean that those antibodies are going to be neutralizing and they're going to be hitting the protein in the right spot to kill the virus. Okay. Nonetheless, this is the antigen that's inside all of us that have been vaccinated. We immediately set out to generate a second generation uh, design. Okay, so this is like challenge one. 
design and improve vaccine antigens. Okay? And this was a work that spanned, you know, I, I do nothing. I just email, right? This is my professional <laughs> job. Um, faculty here are laughing along with this. It's true. They know it's true. Um, this is work that was done by students like you. These are folks who are recent graduate students. And this is a moment in my life that I, I think that I'm most proud of my lab. Uh, when the pandemic hit in February, and we were starting up this completely new thing, they had their PhD projects going, they had stuff going on in their lives. And I said, okay, guys, I think this is gonna be a big deal. You have a decision, you can continue doing what you're doing and finish your projects, or you can drop everything and switch to something completely new. And every single person in my lab said, let's do it. So we all switched. And we work on this literally 24 7 three shifts. Uh, so, uh, what we did was we designed a series of very large panel of mutations, uh, changes to the virus uh, spike protein uh, sequence that we thought would further improve the stability and antigenicity of this molecule. We did a lot of protein engineering approaches, including salt bridges, proline, disulfide, scavenging, filling mutations, hydrogen bonds based on the structure, because the structure guided design to try to lock it into that mushroom shape so it doesn't become that extended harpoon shape. We um, performed a lot of biophysical characterization of these variants, and then we did some historics to try to figure them out. This was all done, um, again, by a large group of people working with a big team. Um, ultimately, uh, I'll just show you the exciting part. We found mutants that can be further stabilized uh, in temperature, which is very important for cold chain issues and could produce much higher yield. This is just a protein gel showing this blue band is brighter than the original design, which was the one that was in the current vaccine by double proline. We had ongoing collaborations with vaccine manufacturers. Um, at that point, unfortunately, even though we delivered this in a month, we could not um, get it into the first gen vaccine clinical trial because they were doing clinical trials at warp speed too, right? So they were planning with this guy in clinical trials. We had something that was already 10 to 30 fold better, but they were, that ship had sailed. So we didn't get into the first-gen vaccines. And despite our efforts, we did get into second-gen vaccines. So here's an electron micrograph taken by my student showing these little beautiful mushrooms that look like the pre-fusion stabilized protein that's kind of dense here, but you can see that they're very, very, um, on a dispersed, very clean protein, very stable protein. And in fact, if you compare the original design that we had over here, and you just cool the protein, warm it, cool it, warm it, do this at, at different temperatures, you can see the original variant starts looking like not so great, right? You can even see that without a trained eye, it was kind of polydispersed, uh, maybe unfolded, little fibrils over here. Whereas our stuff, which we call Texapro, uh, looks like the same throughout. Um, so ultimately that work um, was really the brainchild of these three students in my lab and other students throughout. Uh, we had some nice papers out of it. That's not really that important. What's important is this. Uh, the work has now um, been adapted by multiple vaccine manufacturers for second gen vaccines. Uh, it's used extensively for serological applications for uh, you know, antibody based tests and so on. Where now I just check the staff. I'm not running the clinical trials. That's not my expertise. We just provided the protein. But others have taken them up and put them into different delivery vectors. And now there is clinical trials, including phase three trials in five countries globally. Uh, and um, so some really cool kind of fun stuff that I learned, because I'm not a vaccine developer, um, is that it turns out a lot of the aversion people have to vaccines is needle hesitancy. So there's someone in this room right now who's deathly scared of needles. And when you ask them, you don't have to identify. <laughs> when you ask them, oh, you know, why am I doing, why are you not getting vaccinated? They'll say, oh, I'm doing my research or whatever. But really, they're not doing their research. They're just afraid of needles. And it's like a, a real phobia that faces 10 to 15% of the population. So folks have designed um, uh, vaccination patches. These are micro needles. Don't tell the needle folks. <laughs> you, don't, you don't feel it, right? So these are dipped into our antigen. Right here, these are nanoscopic. That's a 300 nanometer scale bar. Again, this is not our work. 300 nanometer scale bar. These 300 nanometer needles are, um, this, this chip is dipped into our protein and just applied as a dermal patch uh, in post delivery, right? And then you can measure the immune response. It turns out it can be self administered anywhere in a low resource setting. People don't, they don't feel it, and it produces a very strong immune response. So, this is a com completely different way of reaching a lot of people. Uh, that wouldn't otherwise get vaccinated because they're afraid of needles. 
not a small problem. Uh, right. And another important thing here that I want to stress is that others have taken our approach, and because this protein is so stable, you couldn't do this with the original protein, because the second-gen design is so stable, they're able to move it in delivery vectors that are much, much cheaper. I don't know if you know how much a vaccine costs the U.S. government, say, one of the Moderna vaccines. But it's prohibitively expensive to develop into low- and middle-income countries, including the challenges of the cold chain delivery problem, right? How do you get a village in Africa a minus 80 degree freezer to keep the vaccine stock? You can't, right? So um, uh, a group based on our work uh, developed a vaccine that is made in chicken eggs, just like the flu vaccine. It uses the, the, the flu vaccine technologies, which are well-established and distributed globally. The cost per vaccine is now down to 50 cents, which is now uh, a time when we can imagine solving the following gap. Here's the gap. This is data that I pulled out yesterday. If you can see, this is the vaccine update uh, in low middle income countries. Here is where we are, right? We have uh, now administered almost two doses per person, and we have purchased stockpiled more than three point, I think, five doses per uh, eligible human in the United States. So we're stockpiling massive amounts of vaccine, while the developing countries haven't even vaccinated their first uh, Frontline medical workers yet today, right? Because a they can't afford it, and b the, the Western world is stockpiling it, and there's not enough capacity still. So this is 15 percent or so for some of the low uh, low middle income countries. Of oh, their entire population, has only one shot. So this pandemic will rage for many many more years, just not in the West. We've we've successfully made it a low and middle income country back, uh, pandemic. That's what we've done essentially. That's not right. So we hope that this work will enable the development of cheap vaccines that could bring this threshold up much, much higher. The RNA vaccines aren't going to do it. They're just too expensive. OK, that's chapter one. You guys have any questions on that? I'm going to switch topics a little bit. Yeah? So the, when you say that the first-gen vaccine is low yield, so what gets injected is the RNA. So it just doesn't translate very effectively it doesn't translate very effectively. Roughly 50% of the particles that are come out of the spike 2P are already post fusion. So your immune response is not proper. And in fact, some of the systemic side effects, maybe some of you were sidelined for a few days, right? Yeah. Some of those systemic side effects are because they have to inject more material to get a sufficient immune response, right? And so um, we did some trials with them, and the newer antigens would have produced a similar immune response with. Uh, a lower injection dose, but there's no business case, right? We talked about it in dinner too. Those guys will never change their formulation because it's a duopoly and there's no reason for them to do it, right? They're going to keep injecting Gen 1 forever. forever. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, some of the low middle income uh, uh, countries will probably leapfrog in terms of technology, vaccine, vaccine technology. And this happens quite often, right? The early adopters get stuck with the early adopters in hmm. technology. And then, Second gen, third gen technologies will filter out into the world. Although I much prefer to be on the earlier side of things. Yeah. And so then is it likely that, uh, let's say the second gen looks great, but it's antigen based, because the US has stockpiled so much of the first gen, they're probably not going to spend the money to give us all three boosters of the same Yeah. It seems on the business side. Yeah, it is interesting. Uh, as an academic, I've learned a lot about the business side of things. But, anyways. Um, in parallel with all of this antigen design, we were also doing variant tracing because we knew variants would be important. Someone who studies biology, I know evolution doesn't stop. Uh, you know, and in fact, viruses are very good at evolving. So we very rapidly partnered with a colleague, Jim Musser, who runs the infectious disease unit at uh, Houston Methodist Hospital uh, in Houston, and that is a very large hospital system in a very metropolitan city. So we could actually watch the variant sweeps as they were happening in real time. And here are my lab's contributions. They were collecting clinical samples, but they didn't have enough sequencers, and all their sequencers were unavailable for other reasons. So my lab was running, I don't know how many, tens of thousands of, of clinical patient samples through our sequencer facilities and helping them analyze the data. Uh, this is outdated, tens of thousands. <coughs> so that was a really interesting operation. And we were watching the, the waves of variants <coughs> sweeping through Texas while the Texas government and the feds were not funding any of this. This was all academic effort because we knew it, it was going to be important, but they didn't. So here's um, a wave that happened very, very quickly in a pandemic, which nobody kind of paid attention to. Now, we did, because we could see it on the ground. And this is a mutation, a 
called D614G in the spike protein. This is one amino acid mutation that changed in a, in a, a protein that has 1,300 amino acids. So just one amino acid out of 1,300 makes a difference. Um, here's the case counts of this variant. Uh, so D614 was the original Wuhan strain that was uh, de uh, deposited by the Chinese CDC, and the G614 substitution was uh, um, the one that swept the globe in a, in a really a really interesting sweep. It took about two months to become globally 100% of all viruses have that variant. Right? And we saw that not only did it become globally dominant, but this is patient counts over here. Right? So it was clear that um, it wasn't just giving the virus fitness, it was also much more infective for, for humans. And so, you know, uh, the key points are here. We were watching, he was a clinician, so he gets to watch the clinical consequences. We're more like the biologists, we're interested in the viral properties that, that in spite, that made it so much more uh, infectious. Right? Uh, the good news at that time was that the severity of the disease wasn't changing for that particular mutation. The virus didn't evade first gen vaccines and therapeutics, that was good. Uh, and the mechanism, which was what I was interested in, how did it become so much more mutation, is that one particular mutation just changed the virus shape a little bit. So that receptor binding domain, that little green subunit, just flipped up a little better. And by flipping up a little better, it just shifted it to be better at grabbing the cells. And that was enough to drive this massive wave of, of uh, infections in the Houston, greater Houston area. But that brings us to a bigger problem academically. I mean, I don't want to be chasing the next variant that's boring uh, academically to me. I mean, evolution will continue, life will go on, new variants will come around. But the problem is we don't know, and we didn't at the time have any clinical or molecular um, tools to rapidly understand the variant landscape. Because um, if you think about it, even to this day, and I'll talk about what we're doing to try to address that. Well, let me show you what I mean by the variant landscape. Let's see. There it is. So this is a quilt plot of my, that my students did by a bioinformatics search of the GIFSA database. This is a global repository for the genomes of many different viruses, but right now it's basically dominated by SARS-CoV-2. It's at this point roughly about 5 million viral genomes sequenced globally. It's very, very important to understand the viral sequences. Um, this is a, a plot that he made maybe a, a month or two ago, and you can see this area corresponds to the name of the variant. So uh, I think B117, uh, the Delta, they renamed them all. These Delta and Omicron and all these things, they're not scientific, they're not useful to me as a scientist, they're more there was a political decision to get away from um, names like you know, the UK variant or the South Africa variant, right? That's not right. Um, so they, they gave them three letters, still forget what they are. Um, but these are the actual viral clades that we identified. So um, I can't remember, B117, I think maybe Delta. Uh, certainly BA1 and BA2 are the Omicron variants that have swept most recently. Okay. And actually, um, for those of us who are virus variant watchers, BA2 is going to lead to another wave in the U.S. in the next two months or so. You've heard it here first, if you haven't seen it in the news yet. Yeah. <laughs> You've seen it already? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like I can see the cake is baked, and it's just frustrating to see the news and everyone catching up. But we're on the ground seeing this happening. It's like, yeah, I got it. It's coming. It's coming. Yeah. So, but what's the point? Look at all of this. This is the dark matter of the viral genome. This is clearly clinically relevant because these are patients that have been sequenced for their virus, and we have no idea what all these variants are doing. Right? And this can go on to infinity, right? There's low counts here, and we just, just blended it out. Moreover, um, sequencing of the virus is uh, very uneven across the world, and it kind of follows the resource distribution for low income countries. Right? We have, um, in the US, fallen on our face. We have all the money and all the equipment to do the right thing, but we didn't, that was a political decision. We won't go there. Uh, so the US actually lags in terms of variant surveillance, surveillance, and that has changed in the last two years, um, for the better. Uh, Canada, the UK, Denmark, other countries in Europe really lead the way in terms of sequencing. This is 18 sequences per 1,000 cases. It's not great, but at least some view of how the virus is changing. Africa is completely dark, uh, of course. Um, China keeps data for themselves, um, Russia is dark, and so most of the world is dark. We don't know what's happening. These variants are out there, we don't know what the next Omicron will look like. There's no guarantee that it's going to be less virulent or more virulent, that is a myth, just FYI. But my goal as a molecular biologist is to come in and try to understand 
Uh, so, right, we have limited sequencing globally, and we'll be blindsided by the next variant of concern, guaranteed. The problem is this. We're always in a reactionary mode, right? What's going to happen? Another place is going to say, oh my god, all of us are getting sick with a new variant, we've sequenced it, we don't know what it means. A few more weeks will pass, then we'll say, okay, it's spreading globally, and then you know the scientists will get on it, they'll give it a variant of concern designation, and everybody will jump on it. By that point, you're, it's done, right? It's going to be spreading globally again. It's a very reactionary mode that we've been in the whole time. My view as a molecular biologist is what can I do to be proactive, to understand what the evolutionary landscape of the virus looks like. It's not infinite, it will not evolve forever, right? Are we a peak business? Probably wouldn't want to bet, you know, what, is, what the Jurassic Park book, Life Finds a Way, right? <laughs> wouldn't want to bet against evolution. <laughs> but also, it's not infinite. And also, we'd like to anticipate what's coming, right? So, before everybody's falling ill in South Africa or something. So, we develop technologies for that. Um, so, trying to stay ahead of the next outbreak, what we need is high throughput ways to understand how the spike protein is changing. By high throughput, I mean not just testing one variant of concern or 10 of them, which we can do with one graduate student working really hard. But we want to understand that can we do this for thousands or tens of thousands of variants that aren't variants of concern but could be? Can we do this for every possible change in the virus protein and see how that um, changes it? So, this is a complicated picture. I'll try to go through it quickly. It's a schematic picture. Uh, and we developed this uh, um, right after we finished the antigen work, which is now in sunset in my lab. We're not doing any more antigen engineering. Uh, but ultimately, what we're doing is we're using this cell display technology where we take mammalian cells and we um, attach via a flexible protein tether the spike protein uh, onto the cell. Each cell encodes one variant, one different and unique variant of the spike protein. And we can use let's say antibody binding, these are little antibodies that are fluorescent, by N I say neutralizing antibodies, we're hyper-focused on antibodies that can have therapeutic potential. Because antibodies remain not only your best protection from getting sick, but if you're, after you are sick, they are the best therapeutic agents as well for infusions. Right? We've of course seen new variants of concern evade our therapeutic antibodies very effectively. So we're looking at therapeutic antibodies, we're looking at binding to the cell surface receptors and so on. And by using these methods, in addition to the technique called flow sorting, we can really quickly test many different variants for their main properties. And so we have a pretty cool pipeline that my students have built, which includes high throughput cloning and expression. This is all done with robotics and automation, which is really neat. I, I'm so lucky to work with people who are smarter than me, because the students teach me so much, and I really appreciate that they talk me that this can be possible even. Uh, we uh, screen and characterize them using these flow sorting approaches, and in fact, we can use uh, molecular scissors to these uh, the specific proteases, which are proteins that cut out a protein in a specific yellow cut site over here, to put them on electron micrographs and, and take pictures of their surface binding properties and so on. So does this work? It does. Here's a, a, a nice fluorescent image of the protein uh, spike decorating the outside of cells, shown over here. So you see the cell nuclei are in blue, and the protein sits on the outside. We can take this, this spike protein off the cells and look at it by electron microscopy. This is an Eckes contained electron microscopy grid. And you see this as a very characteristic shape, shape, uh, low resolution reconstruction of what we would expect this mushroom to look like. And we can even do a functional test. So we know that the spike protein binds to protein ACE2, which is a cell surface protein that it recognizes. And we can measure how that works. Uh, here's SARS CoV 2 variants. And if they have their sucker binding domain, they bind uh, this ACE2 molecule, which we would expect. If they don't have their sucker binding domain, they can't bind their sucker ACE2. And if you have, in fact, if you look at SARS-CoV-1, it also enters cells via the same receptor. Um, although you can't see the point, but the viruses, the related coronaviruses, MERS and HKE1, enter cells via a different mechanism, not via the ACE2 mechanism. And as you expect, they're dark in our approach here as well. So this is all controls to show that everything's working. I'm going to show you a busy slide. I don't want you to focus too much on all the details, but I want to give you a flavor for what we can do with this. Uh, this is a little heavy here. Yeah. So, for example, we can uh, take a look at variants of concern that already have been out there. This just shows you that the variants of concern are accumulating a lot of mutations in their spike proteins and throughout their genome relative to the reference strain that we call the Wuhan strain, the original virus that were taken out of China. 
Um, so the new Omicron variants that you want to make, you, for example, have way more mutations in them because the virus is evolving. It's drifting away from what it started as than the original variant. Um, this shows uh, a heat map of where the mutations are accumulating. Uh, not too surprisingly, from what we know about the immune system, the variant mutations shown in orange here are accumulating in the receptor binding domain, which is very important antigenic target by immune system, and in the N-terminal domain, which is uh, also, um, so when, also very important for our immune system. So when our immune system generates antibodies, it's basically generating antibodies against this area of the protein and this area of the protein. The rest of the protein is really protected by a glycan shield from our immune system. So these are the entry points. These are the Achilles heel of the virus. And the virus is mutating like crazy in both of these Achilles heels because we've shifted from a situation where initially our population, our, our, um, the virus was encountering uh, immunologically naive host, i.e. a host that didn't have any antibodies. So there the evolutionary pressure was divide or spread as quickly as possible. Now the virus is dealing with a largely uh, uh, convalescent or vaccinated population. So now the evolutionary pressure is mutated away from existing antibodies. Right? So this is a really interesting transition point that the virus is having to deal with. Obviously nature finds a way, life finds a way, and we know where those antibodies are targeting, and not surprisingly, the virus is mutating like crazy in the areas where the antibodies are targeting. Okay. So, um, so here's the design. We have these large, large assembly strategies where we can pretty much very quickly build up uh, through modern approaches uh, any kind of virus combination we want. For the spike protein, we can test how it responds to a bunch of antibodies and then uh, measure their biophysical. So just, just a flavor of what we're doing uh, on this axis here, this is all done by one student now. So the workload has come down from a large team of students working 24-7 to now one student that can do this with their own hands. Uh, so uh, on the X axis here are a number of different antibodies. The names are not very user friendly. These are coming from the literature and other laboratories and, and um, company. Okay. And on the y-axis are little boxes with different circulating variants of concern, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, and various omicrons. Uh, the color bars here represent sensitivity to these neutralizing antibodies. These are all neutralizing antibodies that could have been therapeutic. Some of them were therapeutic. You can notice the Regeneron antibodies that were um, quite popular a little while ago. A red Regeneron um, antibody cocktail consisted of two therapeutic antibodies. Um, and those were incredibly effective against Wuhan 1. Okay, so if you look at those, they were white, which means they would neutralize. We and others have already seen that um, Omicron BA1, these turn red, which means they no longer work. And so taking account of these therapeutic antibodies, what you see very quickly is Omicron is a very obvious outlier. Right? Uh, it, it is no longer... Um, it is no longer affected by almost every single antibody on that list. Yeah. So the only antibodies that are working against an Omicron therapeutically, um, so by the way, the Eli Lilly antibody, that's a funny story, at least your general got their money's worth. Um, they were able to produce the antibodies. This, this is the importance of speed in, in dealing with viral evolution, which are a company. Regeneron made their cocktail relatively quickly in the pandemic. They had scale up issues, but they were able to get it into people and save a lot of lives, frankly, uh, until Omicron hit and just completely wiped it out. It takes about a billion dollars to get an antibody into a human, right? It's a very expensive process to get human therapeutic. Um, so they need to make their money fast. The Eli Lilly uh, antibody, like will be 555, was a therapeutic that they got through trial just in time for it to be wiped out by the beta variant. <laughs> and, again, and so it almost didn't see any patients in real life, and they lost a ton of money on it. Right? It was also because they had a single antibody. It's much easier for a virus to invade one antibody, one bullet versus two bullets. So anyway, um, but what you're seeing is um, looking at antibodies that target the N-terminal domain in that left panel over there. The N-terminal domain is hypermutable, which means it's uh, probably an antibody sink. We don't actually know what it's doing in the spike protein, but pretty much every single variant is very good at invading almost every antibody that we find against the N-terminal domain. It is not a good target for therapeutic antibodies. It's too mutation prone. Um, the RBD, the receptor binding domain, 
is a little more evolutionarily constrained because the virus has to use it to gain entry into cells. It has a secondary function. We don't actually know what the entity function is. Uh, it has to gain entry into cells, and therefore it has a little bit less mutational space. So the name of the game now uh, is to try to create antibodies that are uh, variant independent, like for example, S2H97. It's a best-in-class antibody, which you can see it, it gets through any variant. Right? More antibodies like that that can be therapeutically useful. And um, the data on the right is actually not done by us, it's done by a colleague and collaborator who's taken these antibodies and correlated the fact that we're doing this. This is a toy system, right? This is not a real virus, it's just one protein. Um, he's actually taken and correlated our findings with real viral infection. This is live SARS CoV 2. Uh, I think it's called the hamster model. I can't remember what the animal model is, where they uh, intranasally inject the virus into the, into the animal and then they follow up with a therapeutic antibody to see if it rescues the animal from um, SARS-CoV-2 from these various variants. Basically, it shows that what we're measuring is real and important. Okay, so that's a new technology that we've created in the last year to be able to go after this. But this is not very impressive. This is only maybe eight variants of concern. So now I have a, a, a new graduate student, Anker, uh, who's taken on this project, and he's going big. So he's gonna try to do every single variant ever measured. Because now we've developed a scalable technology where we can use automation to go after not just one or 10 variants, but thousands of different variants. And his goal, and he's very close to doing this, is to be able to measure every single possible amino acid mutation in the protein. Here's just one of the three chimers of units of the spot protein. And in blue, uh, Anker spotted uh, the heat map indicates the normalized mutation frequency of that position. So you can see, if you look at the database, a lot of places in this virus are in this specific protein are mutation prone. Not all variants have all mutations, of course, but we want to understand what all of those mutations do because they're going to come up sooner or later. We need to understand the total evolutionary landscape of this virus. All right, so what Onker is doing is developing these uh, ultra high throughput approaches to define what are variable or maybe invariant functionally important regions of this protein. And the invariant part is the most interesting from my point of view because that's where you want to focus your immune response. If you can find a therapeutic antibody that hits an invariant region of the virus, that's a really important win. Will the virus figure out a way to communicate something invariant? Probably, because it, it would have pressure to do so. But it would be important to do that. We want to map where these antibody epithelial are and where the escape mutations can be. And we want to anticipate the effect of mutations that have not yet been observed clinically to stay, to stay ahead of the virus. We also want to use these kinds of technologies to accelerate prefusion stabilization. And that's challenge three. I'm getting to the end here. Uh, the final challenge is uh, to anticipate the next pandemic, not just the next variant. We've got to think bigger. We can't be in the reactionary mode. It's too late by the time the pandemic hits to start all this stuff up. My dream is to be able to have uh, antigens, first generation antigens, they don't have to be perfect, against all of the zoonotically transmittable viruses that are out there. So we can anticipate the next spillover threat. So typically what happens is these viruses have an animal reservoir, frequently bats, bats, and these animal reservoirs can go through either an intermediate host or enter humans directly, typically via an intermediate host that has an immune system that's similar to both species. And this has been recorded for a lot of viruses, right? And it's probably how SARS-CoV-2 came around. So people know this, and, and uh, there are very nice prediction uh, work on what are the highest pandemic potential viruses. And this is just a list I took from one such paper. If you look at the top 10 uh, worst actors, they're all coronaviruses. And coronaviruses are diverse, present in bats and many other species, adaptable to our immune systems, and are likely going to cause the next outbreak as well. If it's not influenza, it's going to be a coronavirus. I won't pass the family farm on that, but that's my guess. <laughs> so uh, what we're doing now is uh, we've partnered, how much time do I have? Am I done? Close, yeah. Okay, so I'll finish with the last slide. So we have now a large team of folks working across multiple institutions to do just that. So uh, this is not something I could ever do alone in my laboratory, but we are building technologies. Uh, this is a team effort that has come along pretty well, uh, where we're building technologies across multiple institutions to develop rapid response capabilities against existing and possible zoonotically transmitted